the point of someone, can you accept someone's view on moral relativism, for example? Yes. Because if I think in the world which is absolute, I never found it. There are things which we do which you know are quite a faulty, impure, we live in a world of compromises, sometimes contradictions. But instead of having an absolute morality, sometimes I go back to again Vietnam War there was something called the Wyoming Massacre where US troops under Lieutenant Kelly, I still remember this, were ordered to go to the village of my life and to kill every man, woman and child indiscriminately. It was one of the first times a journalist was with the troops, blew the whistle and became a it became a scandal in which Lieutenant Kelly was court martialed and put in jail. But some enterprising journalist did a follow up 30 years later to see what happened to those soldiers who followed orders and shot men, women, and children indiscriminately. And there was always the the, like in any experiment, the control. There was one soldier, he was an Afro-American soldier, who refused to go in to shoot indiscriminately. He disobeyed orders at war. And they interviewed him afterwards. And of all the people they found, he was the only one who you could say was happy, well adjusted, with a good emotional life, a wife and family, and you know, he was Fine. They asked him, but you have to go into military prison for so many years. He said, yes, but it was worth it. A military prison in the United States is much more severe than any prison in the UK. He said, are you willing to do that? But why? How could you know you were going to be punished but stand up for what you believed was, was right? You know, were you a religious uh, uh, person? He said, no, I didn't have a religion. I joined the US Army because I was born in some ghetto somewhere, in some uh, place of no hope, no future, and I only joined the military to get a life out of the ghettos of drugs and violence. And he said, so, did you have a philosophy degree from Oxford? No, I was just an ordinary soldier. So how could you do that? And he said, I just felt my heart. And I just knew it was wrong, I just couldn't do it. He didn't need an education to know that it was wrong. And sometimes, please excuse me if there are any philosophers here, sometimes it's the education which is used as an excuse to go against what one knows is right or wrong. One feels it. If you've ever killed anything, the only one thing which I've ever killed was a mouse. After my father passed away, my mother was terrified of mice. I put a mouse trap out when I caught it and killed it. I felt, I felt so bad about that. I took that mouse to the trash can and I stroked it. Its fur was just so beautiful, so soft. His whole body is an Irish response from kidney. It's the last thing I killed. Couldn't get anything anymore. When you actually saw it, felt it, and knew what you'd done, the intuition was too strong to do that again. So it's one of the reasons why morality has been here. And it's one thing which I even uh, had a seminar with members of the British Army who were fighting in Iraq, in the Iraq war. I told them, never allow your knowledge to 
to stand in the way of truth. You're learning what you're told. That was his advantage. He never go to the university, he never go to a church or a mosque or a Buddhist temple. He wasn't indoctrinated, he wasn't told what to believe. He knew it instinctively. It was wrong. There you found the source of morality. So do you are you saying basically you believe that um, what's right and what's wrong, what's ethical and what's not, what's, uh, is something that all human beings have a very uh, primal intuition of yes. that yes. is veered away through life's difficulties and nurture, for example. Yes. It's, it's, so you believe that humans are naturally good? It's distorted by experts. Right. One of the things which, one of the experiences I had, I was always up for challenges. So there was a local radio show, talk back radio, saying, oh, you're very good at answering questions. Can you come on our show? And so late Friday evening, 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, I got to the radio studio and I didn't have time but he checked what the show was about. And so we were in the studio, the headphones were on, the microphone just as far away, the red lights were on, we were on air. And the presenter said, welcome to not tonight's show. We have uh, Professor Gabriel Morrissey, the author of many books on sex and relationships in Australia. And we have the Buddhist monk, and they could not pronounce my name, so it's just said Mr. Monk, <laughs> on our show on adult themes. <laughs> and I thought, Adjo, well, you're in trouble now. You should have done research, and let's find out what show you are. <laughs> There's a challenge, but I was all about the challenges. So I was on an adult theme show, I talk back. And I remember all the while, it was great that I didn't have any understanding or knowledge because I could see things from a fresh mind. And this taxi driver called him. Wanted to speak, Mr. Monk. And he said, I'm married, I'm having an affair. Is that right? And because I wasn't an expert, I saw through him straight away. I said, if that was right, you would not be ringing me out to ask. And he hung up immediately. <laughs> I nailed him. He wanted to go to some expert to actually to convince him that what he knew was wrong was okay. A lot of times, do you really need an expert? When you know you're hurting yourself and others. So to me, a lot of times, the knowledge we can actually choose which part of the knowledge to justify what we know is wrong to get rid of our sense of guilt and shame. It's okay, everyone else is doing it. When a monk comes along, we don't do that. They say, ah, you know that, it's not true. It is true. We can do the ethics. Why? Because it feels good. I often call myself a good time monk. I had a good time. How did you have a good time by being good? Anyway, I'll let you. Is there any other questions? Questions, if you like. Yes? This kind relative. Relative, how do you mean? something quite, that you think is quite an insignificant thing, a good positive thing, can it have an enormous impact <coughs> in a positive way? How, how, does, how does karma work? How does karma work? One of the important parts of karma is what you need, your motivation, where you're coming from. 
It really comes from kindness, from peace, from gentleness. Now it usually has a good flavor. It may not work first time, but you learn from the results, you grow. One of the things which is important I've talked about this morning, it's all right to make mistakes. Don't be ashamed of making mistakes. So mistakes is where we learn. You have a good mind, so kindness, gentleness, not arrogant or conceited. If you make a mistake, you admit it, you learn and you grow. You get better by making mistakes. So this is how we make use of our life. And then you learn that please, if you're in any relationship, whether it's in work, in the faculty, or in a, in a family, please allow one another to make mistakes, get forgiven, and then you learn to do better next time. And that's called growth. So even if you are badly hurt, say by relationship with such pressure, please don't hide your heart in a concrete bunker. You don't get hurt again. You don't grow either. You stagnate. You go out and go out and learn. Maybe when you only stay to the better next time. That's karma and growth. change karma's strength oh, yeah. in the same act. Yes, the intent can change the karma's act and you can always change karma too. 
So you can hands on whatever cow you've done in the past, you can change it by your attitudes. Why is it that sometimes people do some bad things in their life but they never seem to hurt? Or get punished or whatever, or have a wonderful life. And sometimes it's because when we have a positive mind state, not a mind state of guilt, a positive mind state can actually bring up some of the good karma from the past. When you're very negative, guilty, ashamed, some of that can bring up negative karma. Our attitude, we can always forgive ourselves, which is an incredible thing. But any the doors of suffering are always open. You can walk through at any time if you know how to forgive yourself. It doesn't mean you forget, you learn to become a better person. But punishing yourself for the things you've done in the past doesn't help anybody. And we have a football code in Australia, the Australian Football League, AFL it's called. And it's so popular in Australia. Are there any Australians here other than me? No, okay. So, AFL. Acknowledge, forgive, and learn. So if you have done some bad karma, just acknowledge it. Let somebody know. You're human, you make mistakes. Forgive it, which means no punishment. Because I said today, if you punish people, they refuse to admit what they've done. It goes underground and hides it. Why is it husbands and wives? They don't share the nasty stuff they've done. Because they think, if my wife found out, she'd kill me. She won't kill you, but you know, you could certainly get um, into big trouble. So you hide it. And that's even worse. As soon as it comes to the surface, you're so embarrassed, ashamed. Wouldn't it be wonderful? If whatever mistake you made, you can tell your wife immediately, sorry darling, I lost it. I forgot. Please forgive me. And she helps you. You're saying that because you trust her. You'll upset her, but you really need her help to do better next time. And she will need your help to do better next time. With knowledge, forgive, which is my amnesty. And then you learn not to make the same mistake again. I've seen couples, one couple comes to mind, the wife found a piece of paper in his pocket from a brothel. He'd been visiting prostitutes. And she was devastated by the lack of trust she now had. Her husband had breached that trust they had once had. Because they were both Buddhists, they came to me and I said, look, Buddhist way, he, you know, he, really, he does actually love you. You're a stupid thing, terrible thing, you feel so ashamed, upset about. Can you forgive him? If I forgive him, you'll do the same again. No, just forgive. And the next step is probation for a year. Make sure he gives you all his passwords to his emails. Go to all the pockets, you can check him up, get a private investigator if you like, to follow him. Now he's on notice, if he just breaks his probation, anything, that really is it, done. The relationship is over. And then he promised in front of me, he would never do that again. She promised to give him an extra chance for one year probation. And now, he kept his probation. And now they always come to our temple, every Monday usually, out of gratitude for getting the marriage back together again. He made a mistake, a big one, and she forgave him. And I told him, well, you've got an amazing woman there who forgave you, and then he wouldn't. So said, yeah, you know, he just cherishes that so much, he's so grateful. And for her, you've got a guy there, you know, who's so remorseful. 
You will never do that again, and then you will. And thankfully, we'll live together. And we'll live together until we die. Beautiful act of love, which forgives. But those who are forgiving, they'll learn, spread us in place, and we prevent such things being likely to happen again. That's the power we do. So, okay. Hope that was okay. There wasn't that many jokes. It wasn't such a vibe as I usually do because I was a bit tired. So a bit of a but I did my very best. So, hopefully, it's okay. Okay.
reinstated now, apart from legalities, that I had a good brain. I learned Latin, did well at Latin, so I understand Pali. And using that knowledge of Pali and discriminative wisdom to realize it is legal, it is possible, why not? Just politics. So, to get that, you know, why aren't there? I looked at a picture of the people in Parliament discussing Brexit. How many women were in the cabinet? Australia was worse in the current Liberal government there. Mostly men. Does that mean that women, actually probably because women were too smart to be in government, <laughs> I don't know why, but anyway, but please support the Kunis. Number two, please let me go on. Number two, it's very well known that in religion, especially servant monks or servant priests, was it 7% are responsible for sexual abuse? That was about a number. And you find in any organisation when there is women just in leadership positions, the sexual abuse goes way down. It doesn't disappear. In any religion, it does decrease. So, the religion which I chose and I love and I care for has got such beautiful things in it. Want to preserve those? Preserve even monasticism by having many leaders who are women. Done that in Australia, a beautiful women's monastery. It's, I just want to say it's more beautiful than Body Garden, obviously, where I live. Full of 583 acres. A beautiful land. We have how many nuns there? Bigger these now? 12, 11 or 12. 11 or 12, there's a few novice bigunis, novice nuns. Aspirants, over there it's working really well. Plenty of support. I'm very proud of them. I just want to do the same in England. This is my homeland, I was born here. So I think I can't really sort of uh, just forget about this place. And to do the same there. So please support that on channel. What, what's your address? It's not public, but we have leaflets and we have an uh, email address and uh, what is your website. Address? <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not advertising. It's not a public place. It's not a public place. Yeah, well, sometimes you know when when you <laughs> leave, you know people come. Can, can we come and visit you? Absolutely. There you can go. write on the you can <laughs> write on the email. Just and find out. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. So please support as best you can. So that means you can come and stay, you can come and feed me, please. Yeah. <laughs> so that I can get fat like the monks. Yeah, look at us. <laughs> so I want equity. When she's as fat as me, then I don't need to come to you. Come on, go. Yeah. So that's just one of the nice social things we can do. And it will make us you know, proud you know, that Buddhism is not some of the other religions male dominated. It won't be female dominated. Equity. So anyway, that's one of my projects which I won't stop promoting. Even LGBTQIA yeah. plus. plus promote. There's a couple of people here who reminded me that I bless the women. First gay wedding, which I, I bless. So proud of that and happy with that. Why not? There's so there's many gay people in my <coughs> community of Perth. Ever since this elderly gay man came up to me and he said to me, religion has been so cruel to the gays. He said that with such passion, it really hurt me. We went right inside. 
I thought, I can't stand just to sit by and just let that continue. So, in newspaper articles, publicly, try and support gay and lesbian, every other community. Not perfectly. I was so proud one day to receive the invitation to the gay, it's not a type of gay and lesbian Mardi Gras breakfast. So I'm invited. Well, I'm here. Well, I'm heterosexual before we came, so I would. So, but I was very really wonderful to see anybody who is not treated fairly is given a chance. And that's what Buddhism says, that you are treated according to your actions, not by your birth, by your gender, by anything else other than your actions. If you're disabled, welcome. If you're sick, welcome. But if you know you're a bad person who's cruel and mean, then maybe you're not welcome. <laughs> so anyway, completely too we're getting passionate about that, but some are really concerned about. <coughs> so little by little we do something with your help. So one thing we're thinking of doing, you know, with the Marxist and Russell Bullish Bihari here, is on Waysack Day. Waysack is the biggest celebration in the Buddhist year. Just to have a celebration also for the bikinis. So they just they don't live on thin air. So even donations to help pay their rent eventually get a, a permanent property for them in Oxford. It costs money, but it's worth it. I was we're gonna say that one of my acts of generosity when I was a student at Cambridge this lady gave a talk, I think I was amazing, but I got, got um, uh, sidetracked. And it's a Tibetan now. I'm so impressed that she's actually doing something to care for others, not just talk and write books. I went to my bank the next day, and I drew 20 quid out. And I was really important, I was about two or three weeks food money for me. And my father had died. My mother was just a very uh, secretary running a small company, living in a council house, council flat, sorry, not council house, doing it tough. But still, I went hungry because of that. I didn't eat as much as I needed. But I was always so proud of that. Remember it to this day. It was worth it to do something which I can remember. Even oh, I mean that was about almost fifty years ago. To do something which I can be proud of. To start something. And all you traditional Buddhists, especially the Swalakans here, please support. Please excuse me, monks, but the monks' monasteries are well supported. We have lots of requisites, we have lots of monasteries. How many Sri Lankan monasteries have we got in the UK? How many Thai monasteries? How many Bikun monasteries? Zero. Just starting. So let's do something. Okay, so get the leaflets outside. Please excuse the, the advertising campaign, mm -hmm. but I really believe in this. So, so that's something which I'm very ready to do whatever I can for. And also, please excuse the not giving out the address. The one reason is because this is going like public on YouTube and everywhere, and I'm still alone in the residence. I'm just one bikini. So for my rules, I have to know who's coming and make sure you know that we know people. So, but you're very, very welcome. Yeah. So the email address is just a way for the first contact. But uh, it's very simple. And uh, it's a small place, it's a four bedroom house, but you're welcome to come and stay. Men can stay too if we have the space and if there's another female with me. Um, and also we have a uh, sutta discussion. I'm yet to kind of redo the schedule for the next uh, term because I've just been in Perth on the Rains retreat with Ajahn Brown. Um, but most probably it'll be on a Saturday evening. And we also have meditation every day, just a silent meditation session and then usually a Dhamma talk. So be in touch and yeah. 
and I'm teaching in various places around Oxford as well. So she's a very good nun. I'm stabbed to Agabra QC quality control. Because my reputation is also on the line whenever I recommend somebody. So I make sure that the good teachers, good nuns, who keep their rules, which is really important, so you can trust them. Very good. So there is the advertisement. <laughs> So now I wish you all a very happy evening and uh, see you again soon.